When I told that sheriff we shouldn't talk in front of a woman, that really burned you, didn't it? Matters, Mr. Crawford. Cops look at you to see how to act. Matters. Most viewers will remember The Silence of the Lambs for its unnerving scenes between Jodie Foster's Clarice Starling and Anthony Hopkins' Hannibal Lecter. Those scenes are about exchanges of power and humanity in the face of a high-stakes hunt for a serial killer. But the film would be incomplete without the personal arc of Clarice Starling, from competent but shaky trainee to self-assured field agent. Along the way, she must overcome sexism from the overt. You know, we get a lot of detectives here, but I must say I can't ever remember one as attractive. To the microaggressive. Sheriff, uh, this type of sex crime has certain aspects I just as soon discuss in private. And because cinema is a visual medium, Clarice's navigation through institutionalized sexism becomes a primer on how to deal with the male gaze. In feminist theory, the male gaze refers to the framing of women through a heterosexual masculine lens. Because men historically controlled the means of production and publishing, newspapers, music, and cinema, the perspective was typically of the man behind the camera, the male lead, and the male audience member. Because cinema, in particular, focuses on the visual elements of storytelling, this means that the men take a scopophilic pleasure in the viewing of women. The result of this is that women are typically framed as sexual objects, helpless victims to reinforce a masculine desire to rescue, or nurturing mother figures. And while the existence of a female gaze is something of a combative issue, deconstructionist takes on the male gaze tend to agree on one thing. The male gaze is shattered when the woman is aware that she's being watched. Awareness disrupts the power dynamic at play when a woman is watched against her will. And that's where The Silence of the Lambs comes in. The Silence of the Lambs is a textbook case of the director making some slight alterations to a screenplay to bolster its character's story arc through visual means and deliver information to the audience as efficiently as possible. According to screenplay author Sid Field, a movie is like a noun, a person in a place doing their thing. Screenwriter Ted Talley's opening creates a nice symmetry between the first and final scenes by highlighting Clarice's uncanny reflexes and recognition of her environment on the first page which will ultimately be the ability she uses to save her own life and to take out Buffalo Bill. Tally's first five pages establish her as a star recruit and a confident attitude to match, a sort of Hermione Granger of Quantico. It also gets her to the conversation with Jack Crawford much more quickly. Director Jonathan Demme repurposes the first scene for a training montage just before the end of the first act, but keeps Clarice more grounded by having her make a mistake and get called out for it, a correction that saves her life in Buffalo Bill's basement. Instead, Demi opts to use the opening scene to establish the sexism sub-theme and Clarice's reaction to it. A person in a place doing her thing. The first five minutes of The Silence of the Lambs are largely dialogue-free. We get a small caption in the establishing shot, letting us know that we are near Quantico, Virginia. The camera tilts to show us that we are at the top of a steep hill, and this is where we meet Clarice Starling. Immediately we know that she's an FBI trainee from her sweatshirt. The fact that it is soaked through with sweat shows us that she's tenacious, and her earrings let us know that she's not sacrificing her femininity, even in a man's world. All this in under 30 seconds of screen time for Clarice. Over the credits, Clarice continues her swift run before spying the cargo net, which she struggles with because of her size. At 2 minutes 15 seconds, we get our first spoken dialogue. Darling! With another agent telling her that Special Agent Crawford wants to speak with her. Notably, Clarice doesn't question it, even though her pause shows she's clearly confused. She nods, thanks the agent, and takes off towards Crawford's office, as the audience holds on the agent to drive home that this world is the FBI. The agent's turn to watch Starling run is also the first instance of Clarice being observed. Clarice's run continues past a series of signs on a nearby tree that read, Hurt, Agony, Pain, Love, and Pride. This is subtle world building on Demi's part. Building an environment is as much about ethos as it is setting. This is a world steeped in hustle culture and building strong minds and bodies. All traits associated exclusively with manhood 30 years ago. Keep in mind, we hadn't even reached third wave feminism by this point. 
Clarissa's actions throughout the first few shots indicate she's doing her best to ignore the gender imbalances of the world she's chosen, opting instead to focus on the mission. It's important to note that Clarice spends most of the first five minutes in constant forward motion. She stops initially to look back at where she came from and again when interrupted by the agent, but that is less a full stop and more of a change of direction. Tak Fujimoto's camera remains just as active, gliding with her along the way. Clarissa's physical movement serves as a metaphor for her emotional and spiritual momentum, a fact that Hannibal Lecter immediately susses out in their first meetings. But you could only dream of getting out, getting anywhere, getting all the way to the end of the Clarice briefly says hello to her roommate Ardelia Mapp, played by the woefully underutilized Casey Lemons, before darting through a group of agents cleaning their guns. Again, everything in these first three and a half minutes screams discipline and order above all else. And the blocking of the scene turns FBI headquarters into a maze which Clarice must now navigate. At the end of the hall, Demi finally shows his hand as Clarice gets into an elevator with a group of men. Clarice, of course, stands out as the only woman, but Demi makes doubly sure to separate her from her cohort by dressing her in sweat-soaked gray, while the men are dressed in identical red shirts and khakis, looking like they're ready to run a high-pressure sales game at Best Buy. This is the first time that we see just how diminutive Clarice is, not even reaching the chin of the man behind her. For their part, the men range from uncomfortable to mildly irritated to refusing to acknowledge she's even there. And this is where the feminism of the Silence of the Lambs shines. Clarice is a star pupil on the rise and a woman in a male-dominated profession. There is no way that she doesn't feel the male gaze multiplied times nine drifting over her body, evaluating her, puzzling over her, and most likely fantasizing about her. Do you think he visualizes scenarios, exchanges, f***ing you? But Clarice doesn't even acknowledge it. She barely makes eye contact and waits politely for the doors to close. As the parable goes, a man standing still on the sidewalk is just standing still. But a man standing still in a raging river is resisting. And it works. We see this when Clarice is the lone person left in the elevator by the time it arrives on Crawford's floor. It is the visual equivalent of ignore them and they'll go away. We get more signage as Clarice walks past a sign that reads Behavioral Science Services. Clarice is, again, out of place. But in this case, the dividing line is by class, another sub-theme that Hannibal Lecter exposes, thanks to Clarice's pure West Virginia accent. You know what you look like to me with your good bag and your cheap shoes? You look like a rube. Again, Clarice is given the once-over several times on her trip down the hall. Everyone is dressed professionally except for Clarice, who is given no time to change. Clarice finally arrives at Crawford's office, taking in the massive wall of evidence from the Buffalo Bill case. With almost no dialogue, Demi has introduced us to our protagonist, her fish-out-of-water nature, our antagonist, and how deadly the perverse killings are. This is the fuel for the next 112 minutes. And of course, Jack Crawford is finally introduced to us by, what else? Gazing at Clarice without her knowledge. Clarice's thematic struggle of fighting against the male gaze continues to play out over the rest of the film. We learn that Jack Crawford selected Clarice specifically because she's Hannibal Lecter's type. Crawford's very clever, isn't he, using you? Pretty young woman to turn him on. And oh, are you ever his taste. Crawford believes that if Hannibal is attracted to Clarice, he'll be more likely to cooperate. Of course, Hannibal is far ahead of Crawford and turns the tables, using Clarice's sexuality as a ping pong ball by asking her if she thinks Crawford imagines having sex with her. Jack Crawford is helping your career, isn't he? Apparently he likes you and you like him too. Do you think Jack Crawford wants you sexually? True to form, Clarice brushes it aside by saying she finds the conversation uninteresting. That doesn't interest me, doctor. Frankly, it's, it's the sort of thing that Miggs would say. Not anymore. Upon arriving at Baltimore State Hospital, Clarice is immediately pursued by sleazy lech Dr. Chilton, whom the script describes as a smarmy little peacock. Although the character of Dr. Chilton is downright repellent, you do have to hand it to actor Anthony Heald for embodying the character so fully. There's not a woman alive who doesn't know this guy, and the amazing way he goes cold when he sees he's not getting anywhere with Clarice is pitch perfect. Now, I'm sure this is a great town, Dr. Chilton, but um, my instructions are to Talk to Dr. Lecter and report back this afternoon. I see. Chilton does receive Clarice's first attempt at patronizing flirtatiousness, though. 
when she tells him not to accompany her to Dr. Lecter's cell, but she appreciates the pleasure of his company. This is the first of three attempts by Clarice to charm her way through a situation, and in all three instances she's unsuccessful. Chilton knows she's lying and continues to be cold to her. She tries again with Lecter, who immediately shuts down her interview. Lend us your view on this questionnaire. Oh, no, 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 no. You were doing fine. The third time comes when she meets with entomologists Pilcher and Rodin. Stereotypically awkward nerds who shamelessly flirt with her when Clarice comes to them for help. Of the men in the film, only Pilcher is upfront about his attraction to Starling, and it's an endearing scene because of it. Are you hitting on me, Doctor? Yes. Crawford is slightly less endearing. It's clear Dr. Lecter is onto something when he speculates that Clarice is actually Crawford's type, and that's why she was selected. The camera frequently places the audience helplessly in Crawford's gaze. When Crawford does have the opportunity to treat Starling as a competent agent, if not equal, he fails at that task. Clarice is left standing awkwardly with a group of troopers giving her the same skeptical look she faced in the elevator. This time, though, her own traumatic memories prevent her from stealing herself, and the gaze is more pronounced. Obviously, the finale is the culmination of these male gaze scenes, where the metaphor becomes textual. Clarice Starling is literally unable to see the man who is staring at her, and he treats her as if she's giving a performance. There's a perverse entertainment for Buffalo Bill in watching Clarice fumble, unable to see him. But of course, for a woman who practices navigating a world driven by the male gaze, where she is evaluated, utilized, and observed, this is something that she has developed the intuition to overcome. But none of it would carry the thematic and emotional weight it does if Demi hadn't taken the time to set up the arc in the first five minutes. Ooh, 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 see, I'm right.